Okay, thanks very much, Jackie. Uh, so this is uh, Liz Lebensky with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Division of Migratory Bird Management here in Anchorage, Alaska. And I'm going to talk to you today about some work that Kathy Kulitz and I have been conducting um, in the Bering Sea and the Arctic over the last several years conducting uh, at-sea seabird surveys. I just want to apologize. I'm fighting off a cold. So if you have a hard time hearing me, um, my voice wanes during the presentation, please just holler and let me know. I'll try to speak up. So um, to start off, I'd like to just highlight the areas that I'm going to be talking about. Um, the main study areas we've been working in over the last several years have been in the Bering, Chukchi, and the Beaufort Seas. And as most of you know that this area is a very diverse region with many different water currents moving through the area. Um, different water masses that really impact the availability of food and nutrients for the seabirds that occupy these regions. Oops, I get used to this format. Uh, okay, so what is the need for long-term seabird data? Seabirds are wide-ranging upper trophic level predators that are often great indicators of changes in marine ecosystems. Uh, the birds themselves spend most of the year offshore feeding where because of that we have great data gaps. We don't necessarily know where those birds are uh, most of the year. Most of the monitoring that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service does for seabirds is actually at the colony sites, but for most of the year the birds are at sea and they're not necessarily at the colony site breeding. So the Arctic where these birds occupy is a seasonally dynamic region. As you know, there's a great amount of sea ice variability, especially up in the Chukchi Sea. Many of these waters are not accessible to seabirds as foraging areas throughout the year until the sea ice retreats or there's marginal breaks in the ice. Um, there are great changes in the water masses in the area and that can impact the prey availability for the seabirds when they're foraging. And over the last several years, there's also been a, a big push of development. As you know, in the Arctic, there's interest in oil and gas development uh, we've seen an increase in tourism um, with cruise ships coming into Nome, parking off a of barrow, you know, types of uh, use that hasn't really been seen in this part of the world before. And there's also the concern about the amount of increased shipping traffic as the sea ice uh, continues to recede and we have longer periods of ice-free waters in the Arctic. So what can seabirds tell us about the changing Arctic? Seabirds are great indicators of ecosystem function and health, mainly because they depend on the ocean for food and the nearshore breeding habitats for reproduction. Um, we have the ability to monitor the seabirds while they're at sea when we go out on, on ships and conduct marine bird surveys. And there's also some work that's being done at the colonies, but those limits are very, or excuse me, the work that we do on colonies is often quite limited just because of how remote some of these areas are and the ability to access them to do correct population counts. And seabirds are also uh, predators of ecologically important commercial fisheries. Um, a good example is in the Bering Sea, uh, many of the seabirds feed on small age zero or age one pollock or other types of young forage fish. I'll give you a little bit of a background on seabirds. Uh, so the seabird life history traits. Most seabirds are colonial birds and they tend to delay maturation and do not breed until approximately four to ten years old. So this means that it takes several years for the birds to become able to actually breed and they need to be able to produce a sustained um, good body condition to enter that breeding phase of their life cycle. In general, seabirds are long-lived birds. Um, an extreme example of this is that there is a Laysan albatross that she is now over 60 years old and still producing um, healthy, viable chicks uh, in the Hawaiian Islands, which is pretty amazing. The birds themselves normally just lay one to two eggs, which means there is a very low reproductive potential within one year of a bird's life. And the chick development is also very slow, so the timing of the breeding season is really important. So when the birds show up the colony site, the availability of food in the, the area surrounding that site is critically important to the success of raising a healthy chick. 
And some birds themselves are actually able to forage at a great distance. Um, some have been reported foraging up to 1,500 kilometers from their nesting sites. So a little overview of seabirds in Alaska specifically. We are very fortunate to have approximately 75% of all the, the seabirds in the United States reside here in Alaska. We estimate that's approximately 150 million birds occupying our offshore waters. We have approximately 60 seabird species that we can see, and of those, 38 of those species actually nest here. And in this graphic, um, hopefully you can see the pointer, we have a map of the various seabird colonies around Alaska, and the larger colonies are indicated with uh, bigger circles. But as you can see, most of the coastline all across the state, especially the Aleutian Islands, um, have some very large seabird colonies, and in some cases, some of these colonies, like the Pribilof Islands and the smaller one here in Bogoslav, um, represent the, pretty much the total breeding population of certain species of seabirds. So who are the cast of characters of birds in the Arctic? Uh, in the Arctic itself, we have approximately 40 species of seabirds that we typically see. Of those, the majority are local breeders, but then we also have several birds like shearwaters that are migrants that come up from the southern hemisphere during the Alaska summer to feed on our nutrient-rich waters. Of all the birds, uh, of the most common birds in the Arctic, 10 species make up approximately 95% of the total of bird, bird abundance. And those birds are the least auklets, crested auklets, short-tailed shearwaters, uh, two species of phalaropes, common murres, black-leaded kittiwakes, and then there's a couple others um, like guillemots, and then you'll also see um, some uh, thick-billed murres in the region too, and the puffins. So this is a very large list of birds that you expect to see, and it also covers a large difference variation of foraging guilds. We have a mix of seabirds that are known to be planktivores, piscivores, omnivores, and there's some benthic feeders such as the sea ducks, the spectacled eiders, and some of the other uh, common eiders that feed up in this region. So now I'm just going to take an overview of the actual data that we've collected over the last few years and the at sea data that we had um, from earlier prior surveys. So most of our seabird data is archived in the North Pacific Pelagic Seabird Database, and the acronym for this is the MPPSD. And the image here you see on the screen is the surveyed effort that was um, compiled from, let me see, in the early 1970s through 1995. What we see here are where the majority of the surveys were conducted during that time. And if you look up, into the Bering Sea, going through the Bering Strait, and up into the Beaufort and Chukchi, you see most of those areas are either gold or blue, which indicates the surveys were done mostly in the 1970s um, related to the OXEP work that was being done, but then also some later on work that was done by George Hunt and others um, in that region. So the Fish and Wildlife Service identified that there was a really a, a need to update the information that we had on seabirds in Alaska during that time. So in 2006, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service began an at-sea survey program, and our goal was to update the available seabird data in the MPPSD. And we accomplished this initially by collaborating with multidisciplinary oceanographic research projects that were going on to get a better understanding of seabird distribution and abundance. So in more recent times, from 2010 to 2016, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in BOEM, we entered an interagency agreement to conduct surveys uh, mainly up in the areas where there's interest in offshore development in the Beaufort Sea, Chukchi, uh, Bering Strait region of Alaska. And the main goal was to identify seasonal and interannual distribution abundance, community structures, and what environmental drivers in these areas could actually be influencing where the birds were going to be showing up. And the image I have right here is just the BOEM 
the, excuse me, the planning areas that BOEM had established in 2010. Uh, the gray areas are regions or blocks that have been um, withdrawn from lease sales. And then the main planning areas that I was talking about up here in the Beaufort and Chukchi Sea and the Hope Basin also. So where have we been? So since 2006, uh, we have conducted over 200,000 kilometers of surveys uh, in the offshore waters of Alaska. And you can see the map here, the majority of the work that we did early on was in the Bering Sea, but more recently we have uh, really been concentrating our efforts up in the Chukchi Sea in Beaufort. And we've had a couple cruises that actually did go quite a ways north. We didn't quite make it to the pole, but we were up to, I believe it was like 88 degrees north um, on one of our cruises. So we really have a great uh, spatial coverage for a lot of these areas and over a relatively short period of time. Uh, the image here of the panel on the right shows our survey effort that has been broken down into 60 kilometer hexagon, hexagon blocks. And what you see is a heat map, and you can see that the majority of our surveys have been done uh, in the outer Bering Sea, with some concentrations of work being done going up through the Bering Strait and into the Arctic. And our hope is over the next few years, uh, we're continuing this interagency agreement with BOEM, and we anticipate conducting more surveys in the Arctic. And one of our goals is to expand our survey effort um, some more into this less covered area of the Beaufort Sea. So quickly, I wanted to touch on the work that we are beginning to do with the DBO boxes. Um, as you know, the, there are there are eight DBO boxes that have, or excuse me, sites that have been chosen to represent the biodiversity and change that's occurring in this area. Um, these sites are visited and occupied throughout the year by national and international research teams that have uh, agreed to a data sharing plan. So we've been fortunate over the last several years and participate in several of these surveys also um, on different platforms, and we anticipate continuing with the, those surveys over the next few years. Uh, currently, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and ABR, um, Alaska Biological Research based in Fairbanks, we're uh, compiling our data, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife being the surveys that we've conducted off research vessels, and ABR has collected a lot of data up in the Beaufort and Chukchi, um, working with industry. We're combining our data to see how our efforts that we've, um, our survey efforts within the DBO boxes, how do those results within the DBO boxes, how well do those boxes represent the region around the DBO areas. And so we have just begun some preliminary analysis and we're going to be working on this project um, I anticipate over the next several months and hope to have a paper produced here in the near future. And so here's a quick look at some of the preliminary work that we've done uh, with the analysis. This is just a quick overview showing the uh, linear predicted average of the number of seabirds you'd expect to see as you go up in latitude. So if you look at the bottom panel here, this is uh, the latitude going up past 70. And the y-axis is actually uh, shows you the expect expectation of the average number of birds you'd expect to see on a logarithmic scale. So what appears is that as you go north, the number of birds comes does decrease a little bit. And then as you go up through the Bering Strait near 66 north, there's a spike in the number of birds that we're seeing. And we believe that is greatly influenced to just the large colonies of breeding birds in that area. And as you continue further north, you can see the number of birds drops off, especially once you get past 70 uh, north. There's a steep decline in the number of uh, birds that you end up seeing during your surveys. Okay, so next I'd like to take a look at uh, species richness and abundance changes as ice retreats. As we know, um, the Arctic itself, there's a lot of sea ice that's moving around during the years, and that really impacts where the, what areas the birds are willing and able to occupy. So here we have a breakdown of the seabird densities. Uh, the first panel on the left shows uh, 
Oh, sorry, I should just note that this is using uh, the Chow Index of species diversity. And the Chow Index is used to identify areas, species richness, and it also helps account for survey efforts. So if there are certain areas where we haven't had a good survey coverage, um, the index allows us to extrapolate a little bit better and identify what might be happening in that area. And it also helps us with uh, species that are quite rarely seen and accounts for their uh, occurrence. So get back to the panels um, in July. We can see that we had the highest species richness was occurring along the shelf break uh, in the Bering Sea. Most of the birds are in this area and very few have really started to move north except for some isolated pockets. As you move into August, uh, there's a shift in the distribution. Uh, we can see the birds in the Bering Sea starting to move more towards the inner domains. And the concentration of seabirds off the Chukchi up here really tends to increase um, in the middle of summer. And as we move into September, uh, species richness tends to be the highest um, in all the regions. You can see there's a great number of birds staying close to the near shore waters off in the Chukchi and also the middle domain of the Bering Sea. And now I just want to take a closer look at the seasonal distribution of shearwaters. Uh, this is just a different way to look at, to identify how differently birds use different habitats in an area throughout the year. Uh, the first panel shows the distribution of shearwaters in let's see, December through March, so essentially the winter season. And what we have here is a heat map, so the light colors indicate areas where there is zero to just a few birds detected. And as you go up the scale, that shows an increase in the density of seabirds. So as we go over to spring, you can see there's more activity of the shearwaters are starting to show up, especially concentrated along the Alaska Peninsula and out towards the Aleutian Islands and Unimac Pass. Uh, moving into summer, there's again an increase of birds in June and July. Right now, you can see the concentration of seabirds, is, or excuse me, of shearwaters is very high um, going through Unimat Pass and right along the north shore of the Alaska Peninsula and moving up all through the Bering Sea. And you can see there's also a few birds that are starting to make it north of St. Lawrence Island and move up into the Bering Strait. And in fall, which we identify as the months of August through November, uh, this really is the highest density period for shearwaters that we have in Alaska. Uh, the birds have fully moved up here and they're feeding. As you can see, there are very high concentrations of shearwaters throughout the study area, including even the uh, shallow waters kind of off of uh, Cape Newingham in the Bristol Bay area of the Southern Bering Sea. Uh, very many birds going up through the Hope Basin and all throughout the Chukchi Sea, uh, past Barrow and into the Beaufort even a little bit. And here I just wanted to give an example of how we can actually use uh, seabird data and combine it with um, some of the other oceanographic and um, prey data that's being collected during these multidisciplinary uh, research projects. So the panel that I'm showing here is data that we collected during the Arctic ice cruise, I believe in 2012. And the red circles show the number, excuse me, the density of least auklets that were observed during the surveys. You can see uh, overlay of the DBO boxes also on this map. And the underlying uh, layer that you see actually shows the density of zooplankton in the, that was detected in the area. And so you can see there's definitely some hot spots where the birds um, are showing up. And so the interesting thing to note is that this, this bird that we're talking about, the uh, least auklet, they breed here mainly in um, St. Lawrence Island. And they also, from breeding, I think the furthest northern colony is here in the Diomedes. But as you can see, there are so many least auklets that are detected all the way up north into the Chukchi Sea. And one of the things that Kathy and I were really wondering about is if just the high density of zooplankton uh, availability in these northern waters of the Chukchi really make it more efficient for the birds to, f to fly that distance from their breeding sites to actually go and feed. 
versus staying locally, maybe taking more time to forage to get the same amount of food that they could find in that in the local area. So now I just wanted to wrap up quick by talking about what projects we have coming up in 27, excuse me, in 2017. Um, we are going to be part of the Arctic Group project. We'll be sailing with uh, Ed Farley and his uh, crew going into, I believe, is uh, end of the summer. We'll be part of the Asgard project with uh, Seth Danielson coming up in June. We'll have seabird researchers aboard Ambon. I believe we're hoping to send an observer out on the Canadian icebreaker cruises, um, Jackie's and Lee's DBO trips. And we'll also be participating in Northern Bering Sea Fisheries Survey headed by uh, Jim Murphy and NOAA Fisheries out of Juneau. And here's just a quick overview showing where some of these survey efforts are going to be taking place. Here's the Arctic Ice Survey that will be taking place in uh, August through October. It will be broken into three segments. Um, we're really anticipating working here in the Beaufort Sea where we really haven't had too much survey effort over the last few years. And we'll be heading there first and then working our way back, um, back down towards Nome as the season progresses. And in June, we'll be heading out with Seth Danielson aboard the Sekuliak, uh, where we'll be working here in the northern uh, Bering Sea area going up towards uh, Cape Lisburn. And we're also going to have an observer aboard the Ambon project for the second year uh, collecting seabird data. And I also just, before I go, I wanted to also highlight some of the other work that we're going to be doing. Um, we're also going to be aboard the University of Hokkaido ship, the Ashore Maru, who's coming to Alaska this summer. So we anticipate having a seabird observer there and coordinating um, with their researchers just to see how they've been collecting seabird data and see if there's any additional works that we can do together. And last but not least, um, I just wanted to thank all the many different funders, contributors, and participants that we've had over the last several years um, in collecting these data sets. As you can see, there have been a lot of players, and I'm sure that I'm missing some folks, um, I'm missing some people, but um, being able to collect such a large data set has really been a challenge, but it takes a lot of great, wonderful collaborators that we've been fortunate uh, to have as partners over the last few years. So if you have any questions, um, I'd be happy, happy to answer them right now. All right, Liz, thank you very much. That uh, was a very in, uh, informative uh, presentation. You have a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of symbols on your last uh, I slide. I do. <laughs> <laughs> There's a but lot I, of I'm people, happy. Jackie. <laughs> I know, I know. And then, well, that gives you good, uh, and you can see that on your previous slide about the number of cruises that are going on this year, and I'm happy to hear that this may be continuing on in the future with some potential bone funding and others. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, we're working on that uh, interagency agreement right now. Nothing's been finalized yet, but I anticipate that uh, Kathy and I are going to be able to continue this work over the next several years. All right. Thank you. Uh, are there questions anybody has for Kathy? You can uh, raise your hand or um, I guess actually get on the line. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a question. This is Will Ambrose. Um, yes. Looking at your distributional maps, and for those of us who worked up in the Chukchi, um, it, it looks like you've got maybe one transect into Russian waters, probably into Edmund Rusalka, I don't know, over towards Wrangell Island. Yes. So my question is, if you're looking at uh, interannual differences and long-term trends, um, given that, that birds fly, most of them, um, how do you know that the birds aren't shifting into Russian waters uh, and you're not counting them? Yes, that's actually a really good point. Um, that's one of the comments that Kathy and I often think about too, is just past that international dateline. It's almost like you don't necessarily know. We have some older data that we have that has been collected in prior years in the NPPSD, but you're right, our survey effort over into Russian waters has been very limited. And um, for the most part, we do have, uh, I just want to mention we do have some uh, seabird colony data that I didn't represent in this slideshow, which shows where a lot of those seabird colonies are. So we have an idea where the birds nest, but we don't have accurate information as to what waters they may be occupying. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, the follow-up question to that is, you know, is there, a, is there any thought or effort to trying to collaborate with our Russian colleagues to do more systematic 
sampling in their waters? Well, we have been, um, we did participate in Roselka, I believe in 2012, we went on two cruises and in 2014, I think we went out on a cruise then. So we have had some recent surveys there, but right now we don't have any active partnerships um, with the Russians. I know that that is something that has been um, on our wish list <laughs> to be able to do. And actually, Kathy, right now, she's attending a meeting in the Faroe Islands um, as part of the Seabird Group of CAF. And I know there's a Russian representative there, and we're always open to collaboration efforts if that's possible. Um, our waterfowl division actually has had some success uh, coordinating with some of the waterfowl surveys that have been conducted over in Russia. So I think um, I'm always optimistic that we can potentially have more surveys in Russian waters over the years. We just got to keep trying. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, I would just, I would just add that uh, something to think about is that during the PAG meeting that we had in China last fall, it, the Chinese and the Russians have come up with an agreement, and they went out to sea on the East Siberian Sea, uh, and they plan to do this on a on a regular basis. So I should, I'll email you. Uh, we're having a PAG meeting soon, but to bring up with the contacts in China, particularly, uh, maybe the potential of having a survey, uh, having a seabird observation because I don't think they have any of those observers going out on that ship. I will find oh. out, but that might be a connection that would be useful considering that they have built, they've come to an agreement between the Russians and the Chinese to do that survey. And they're working the East Siberian out to the outer shelf and slope. So that's something um, I'll, I'm writing down. Just to let oh, you know that'd be you. wonderful, Jackie. Thanks so much. Yeah, that would be wonderful just to even uh, kind of get your toe in the door there and see if there might be opportunities to collaborate. Yeah, I was thinking of that. And also with Rosalka, you know, it's, it's in the suspended mode, but we keep pushing to see a potential alternative. So we, um, you know, we just have to see where it goes. But there are no plans for that, obviously, this year. Right, right. Yeah. Are there other questions? Anybody? Well, I, I want to thank you. I think because uh, what you presented here, if you look at our performance elements, I mean, you I can click off things that you covered. You know the distribution abundance time series, and uh, I th it was nice to see because that's part of what we're trying to look and what are the mechanisms and fortune factors on the ecosystem. So I want to thank you, even in spite of your cold, and you did a great job to do this. Thank you very much, Jackie, and I really appreciate you guys giving me some time to give an overview of the work that we've done the last several years. Thank you. Excellent.